Hello learners, it is a beautiful day, a very beautiful day that again we are meeting for this session of ours, being our first class this semester and uh, also part of uh, the videos that uh, we are recording for the students who normally use a pre-recorded version, it is surely a beautiful day because it's the first video this semester. And uh, today's session, I'll want us to look at uh, financial management and financial management uh, remember, it is a very important unit in our course, which at any given point in time, we must always be very perfect on. So in our class today, I want us to handle the uh, last sitting uh, paper, that is an uh, April 2023 paper, the exam that was just done the other day, that, was, uh, that is of course last week. So I want us to look at this paper and see what you guys, you are required to do. Remember, as I've always said, like uh, the secret with passing financial management, which again we can prove with this paper which was tested uh, just the other day, is you must be very good on some specific topics which will include the aspect to do with type value of money, aspect to do with valuation of securities, talk about introduction to capital structure decisions, talk about introduction to capital budgeting decision, of course, matching the same with theories as well as uh, maybe complementing it with portfolio analysis. These are some of the main topics that you just need to be very good at, regardless of uh, which, regardless of financial management that you're doing in whichever course that you're doing. So these are some of the specific areas that you need to be very, very good at. So this one can also be proved with the paper that was just done the other day. In our today's session, I want us to jump straight and uh, look at uh, question number one. Basically, we are going to handle the theory part and the computation part of it because I mentioned theory is also very important. So if we can check out this question of ours, you see that uh, I'm having uh, this question of ours, which was uh, basically part A was theory. This is uh, April 2023 exam. Question number one, but A was literally theory part, which comprised of uh, seven, eight marks. Then we're having the other part, which is uh, basically part B of the question, which are uh, comprised of uh, the remaining marks, right? So these are uh, the questions that I want us to do. Actually, question number one, part A and part B. Remember, like, uh, if you don't have this past paper, I'm going to try as much as possible. I upload this paper or what you can do just below this video you can see we have a link i want you guys to use that link to download this specific paper of financial management last sitting april 2023 so question number one part a question number one part a i've projected the question there which i believe all of us we are able to see that question of ours right i believe that we're able to see that question of ours so these are what you're asked but a of the question we are told that uh, management of a limited liability company that is a management of a limited liability company is appointed to promote and protect shareholders interest mm -hmm in the performance of their functions good we also told that uh, the aim is to maximize shareholders value the management however could have interests that might be in conflict with shareholders interest the moment i've seen that even before we go to the question i should be able to identify that this question is coming from which topic because if you're able to figure it out, it will be very easy for you to do what? To handle that question. So literally you can see that uh, this question is uh, under the overview of financial management, which is topic number one. And specifically, we are talking about agency theory. Even before we go further, clearly you can see there is a concept with what? Agency theory, whereby you know very well that management basically are there to work for on behalf of who? On behalf of the shareholders. So, go to the questions you are told required, number one. In reference to the above statement, identify this type of conflict in modern-day financial management of firm. So, you know very well that this is basically agency theory. 
and therefore the conflict that we'll be talking about here is uh, literally uh, aspect to do with what uh, we can talk of urgency conflict right even before we go to any other item once you are able to identify that you're dealing with a question from which area which specific topic it will be very easy for you so here we are asked like uh, part a uh-huh sorry we need to identify this type of conflict in modern day financial management of our firm so literally in that case we can see that uh, that is uh, basically what that is basically that is basically aspect to do with uh, agency conflict that is number one, which you are given one mark. Number two, we are told uh, we need to basically explain. We need to explain three factors that could, uh, three factors that could, three factors that could contribute to the conflict identified in A one above. What will lead us to have this conflict between management and shareholders? What will lead us to have this kind of a conflict? What will lead us to have this kind of a conflict? My good students, anytime you're talking about conflict arising, number one, we should always know that aspect I'm having here, our shareholder. We're having shareholders, right? And we're having, of course, our management. So you'll find that uh, in this case, management, literally, they are working for shareholders. So what will lead us to have a conflict between management and shareholders? These are some of the things that you can just always kind of uh, think about them and try to come up, of course, with a solution in relation to the same. So what are some of the things that basically will literally lead us to have conflict? Of course, when you're not paying me well as a manager, when you're not paying me well as a director in that company, this will lead us uh, not to have, uh, not, to be in, uh, not to be in good terms, right? So literally, you can talk about aspect to do with uh, different goals and incentives being our number one point. We can talk about different goals, talk about different goals and incentives, different goals and incentives. This can lead us to have conflict. And why is Molimo talking about different goals and incentives? In this regard, you'll also be able to understand that management may have different goals an incentive than shareholders. For instance, they be more focused on increasing their own compensation, job security, or personal prestige, which could be at odds with maximizing shareholders' value. And as such, of course, we can't avoid conflict. There must be a conflict. Because for me, I'm looking at a way whereby the best way that you can pay me very well. You as a shareholder, you want to maximize your wealth. For me, I'm working on my interest, right? So in this case, of course, we'll always be having conflict. Then talk about uh, basically number two, also in relation to as much as you're having uh, so many points, you can talk about uh, other key point, which is uh, also very important is risk aversion. I'm going to explain this. Talk about uh, risk aversion. Talk about risk aversion. How is risk aversion uh, be a conflict? How will it be a conflict? You'll find that management may, may be more risk averse than shareholders and may therefore prefer to invest in safer, lower return projects that are less risky rather than taking on higher risk with higher return investment that would be more beneficial to shareholders. Probably I'll look at it in a point whereby <coughs> if at all I've invested probably in a riskier investment, I might end up losing. And therefore, in this case, it might threaten probably my job security because in terms of I'll be, I'll be told that I'm not performing well. And in such case, I might end up losing my job. So you'll find that I will be kind of uh, shy in investing in riskier projects. But remember, these risky projects are the ones that do have higher returns. And uh, as such a case, you'll find that probably shareholders will want to majorly invest in these risky projects with higher returns. But in this case, it will be in conflict with managers who will wish to keep or invest in safer areas that they know very well that they are guaranteed of the returns, so the returns are quite low. So you'll also find that that could also be a reason for the conflict between managers and shareholders. Okay, then that should take us to point number three. In this case, of course, you can talk of uh, uh, lack or rather what you normally refer to 
asymmetry of uh, information asymmetry of uh, information i'm going to explain this remember we have a lot of points which we shared of course also in our notes and also uh, i'm going also to attach topic number one everything in topic number one under this video so that you guys should also be able to go through that clearly okay so in this case we are talking about asymmetry of uh, information in a sense that uh, management may have access to more information about the company's operation, financials and prospects than shareholders, which could lead to a conflict of interest, right? Because in this case, I'll feel frightened. How do you know, how do you know me more than myself? You know me more than myself. In, if I told you to look at it in that sense, you'll find. So in such a case, of course, there will always be conflict of, uh, conflict of uh, basically, uh, interests so these are some of the items which you can mention so you are not limited to the factors uh, the three factors that we've given we have a lot of factors which you can literally which you can literally mention okay so go to uh, the same question that is uh, of course you've handled uh, part a of the question and part b part two so part three of the question uh a three we are asked here that uh, we are told like uh, as a financial as a financial management profession, as a financial management professional, explain four strategies that could be used to manage or mitigate this conflict to protect shareholders. We've identified and agreed that yes, I'll be having this conflict which will arise. So therefore, as a management professional, how then can we basically make sure that these conflicts are avoided? Mm-hmm. How will you make sure that these conflicts are avoided? Number one, of course, you can always tend to talk about uh, transparency, which is uh, very key, right? So talk about uh, when you are talking about the strategies, strategies that you can always tend to adopt. Number one, we are talking about what aspect to do with uh, disclosure and transparency. Disclosure, disclosure and transparency this will lead to reduction of these conflicts uh-huh then of course you can also talk about uh, basically uh, executive compensation executive compensation executive compensation when you're talking about executive compensation, you'll find here, my good student, is that like uh, uh, executive compensation, uh, basically just you add on performance, right? If we ride in performance, you'll find that uh, literally it will uh, make, it will kind of uh, instill uh, this factor to the management that the more I perform, the more I earn. So that will also try to reduce that. Then also we can talk about uh, basically uh, board oversight and so many other points that you can talk about. So about uh, basically board oversight, yeah, board oversight, where in a sense like uh, the board of directors can provide oversight and uh, monitoring of management to ensure that they are acting in the best interest of shareholders. This can involve regular meetings and reviews, the establishment of committees to evaluate specific areas of management, and the appointment of independent directors with relevant expertise, right? And so many other points that you can give. Remember, Olimu is just giving us some specific areas that uh, we had mentioned. And of course, oh, we can also talk about uh, maybe uh, shareholders' activism. Shareholders' activism, right? Talk about uh, shareholders' activism. Shareholders' activism, right? In a sense that uh, at this point, when you're talking about shareholders' activism, you'll find that uh, shareholders can use their voting power to influence the company's direction and management decisions. For example, they can vote on executive compensation, board appointments, and other corporate governance matters, and can also engage in direct dialogue with management to express their concerns and preferences, right? And so many other points which you can list, and so many other points, basically, which you can list, which you can list. So, this is a what you expected basically to handle. And remember, these are suggested solutions, right? Which, uh, as at the end of the day, you must be very good at. So, literally, that is a what you are expected to do in part A of the question. 
Now, I want us to jump in uh, part B. So, we are done with the uh, overview, which I was uh, tested in that bit. Go to part B of the question. Part B of the question, it is uh, under capital budgeting decisions. And uh, these are what you're having in part B of the question. I'll share the question there, which I believe is uh, very visible. I'll want us to handle part B of that question and see what we will be requested to have. Or rather, what the examiner wanted us to handle. So, in part B of the question, these are what you're told. You are told, my good students, that uh, I'm having, of course, this company known as Sipo Limited. We're having this company known as what? Sipo. Sipo Limited. Sipo Limited. Sipo Limited. Okay? So, these are what you're told. The Sipo Limited is evaluating an investment project which requires the importation of a new machine at a cost of 3.7. The machine has a useful life of six years and a salvage value of one million, okay? Additional information given here, we are told that uh, the following additional cost will be incurred in relation to the machine, right? So, of course, before we start uh, using this machine, these are the costs that you are going to incur, which you normally refer to them as the incidental costs. These in incidental costs will uh, include, number one, modification cost, import duty, Installation cost, freight charges, okay? These are the costs that we're going to incur before we use this machine. Note two, the machine is expected to increase the company's annual cash flow before tax as shown below. So, the machine is expected to increase the company's annual cash flow before tax as shown below, which literally I'm given at that point, I'm given uh, which is uh, shown as follows. So I'm given uh, year one to year six, increase ca in cash flow. I'm also given at that point. Come to note three. Note three, you are told that the machine is to be fully depreciated over its useful life using the straight line method. So that should bring us to the concept of what? Depreciation, right? Aha, uh -huh. the good thing here is that uh, the examiner has told us that the corporate rate of tax is 30%, while the cost of capital is 10%, okay? The maximum acceptable payback period for the company for all project is four years. The maximum acceptable payback period for the company uh, for the company for all capital projects is four years. So, meaning that there's a concept of a payback period here that we are looking at, right? Mm -hmm. So, after that case, uh, we are having, of course, a... Uh, other item uh, required basically number one total initial cost to max annual net cash flow payback period of the machine net present value npv of the machine as well as we need to advise the company management on whether to import the machine based on your results in b3 and b4 uh, above okay so given such a question, my good students, where are we going to start from? At this point, whenever I have such, I should just be smiling. I should just be smiling. And why should we smile? We should smile because we literally have everything in mind. And these are concepts that we've been looking all through. So our task here today is just a matter of applying what we studied, right? So I've just... Uh, pin that question of ours below there i believe is uh, very visible i want us to handle this question very quickly you'll agree with Malimu that it's, it was uh, one of the simplest uh, question this time round so uh in this case uh these are what you need to do number one you are told to analyze the total initial cost right of the project so we are having initial cost Based on what you are given, how will you achieve our initial cost? That will be very simple, my good students, because I'm having, of course, the cost of this project, or rather the cost of the machine. So literally, we are talking of uh, basically the cost of the machine to be our aspect to do with the cost of machine. So I'll be having cost of machine being our number one. We are going to add, of course, these other incidental costs that we incur, such as what I was given there, I'm having 
um, I can see I'm having a modification cost. So I'm going to add, of course, here, modification cost. Allow me to use MC. I'm going to have import duty. Allow me to use ID. I'm going to have installation cost. Allow me to use IC. I'm going to have basically freight charges. Allow me to use FC. So the cost of the machine, modification cost, uh, basically these are what you're given import duty. I'm given aspect of IC, which you've taken it to be uh, installation cost and freight charges. This is what will literally give us what? The cost of the initial cost of the machine, which I think that's why you are given only one mark because it's just a matter of copying and pasting. So these are what you are going to do. We know very well that uh, cost of machine, cost of machine, in this case, I am having basically 3.7 according to what I was given there, right? Then I'm given uh, basically modification cost, modification cost, modification uh, cost. You can see I am given a figure of basically a thousand. My figures are in thousands. I'm having import duty. So I'm having import duty here. Import duty. I am given a figure of 900. We are having installation cost. Installation cost, my good students. You can see installation cost. I am given a figure of 375. And finally, I'm having the freight charges here. Freight charges. Freight charges. Freight charges, we can clearly see I was given a figure of how much? 275. So we need to determine the total cost of this machine, the initial cost, which literally in this case you can do it using your calculator. Where I'm having 3.7, I'm having 1,000, I'm having uh, 900, I'm having here 375, and you're having here 275. So I'm talking over basically that is uh, of course uh, 3.7. Uh, sorry, in that case I've inserted uh, that is uh, of course uh, 3.7, right? 3.7. Talk about 900. Talk about 375. Talk about this is 225, right? This is uh, that is uh, 225 what is wrong with my calculator mm. plus a thousand this is a 225 remember this is a 225 based on the question this is a 225 right so uh, basically I'm having of course uh, uh, I don't know why my calculator is not clicking just a moment here so 3700 plus a thousand here plus uh, 900 here, plus uh, 375, mm -hmm. plus uh, 225, which in this case I'm getting 6.2, correct? So this is our initial cost that Molimo is getting. Kindly you can confirm with your figures. So I'm getting our initial cost to be 6.2. And that is what the examiner wanted us to compute, as simple as that, right? As simple as that, as simple as that, as simple as that. Now, proceed to question number two. Uh, part two of that, we are told, annual net cash flows, annual net cash flows, annual net cash flows. By the fact that you are given, by the fact that we are given aspect to do with depreciation, and you are given tax, so therefore literally what the examiner wanted you to compute here is the annual net after tax cash flows. At any given point, you, you have seen tax somewhere. What should always ring at the back of your mind is the annual net after tax cash flows. That is what we'll be expected to do. So mark for Mwalimu, our initial cost we've agreed is 6.2. So I see I'm going to write it somewhere. That is 6.2, what we have determined, right? So let us determine our annual uh, net cash flows. Uh -huh. So I'm going to erase here. I'm going to erase here. We have, I need to determine annual net cash flows. I need to determine our annual net cash flows. I need to determine our annual net cash flows. That will be simple, my good students. You are given everything there. Our task will just be a matter of copying and 
investing. That's a good thing. It's financial management. So many years are we talking about here? I'm having year one. I'm having year two. I'm having year three. I'm having year four. I'm having year five. And you're having year six. Basically what I was given, right? So cash before, cash flow before depreciation. What was I given here? The cash flow before depreciation, I can see I was given an uh, increase in cash flows. So basically in this case, I'm given 1760. So these are cash flow before depreciation. I'm given uh, basically before tax, I'm given 1760. Year one, year two, I'm given 1360. Year three, I'm given 1050. Uh, actually, we can either use you can either use it uh, we can either use uh, this vertical or or horizontal. So uh, we c I'm having uh, aspect to do with nine hundred. I'm having aspect to do with uh, eight forty. Then I'm having aspect to do with uh, seven fifty, right? Basically, what I was given. Remember, at this point, we need to determine annual net after tax cash flows. And we had depreciation. So therefore, in this case, let us less our, uh, first of all, we can less our tax because I'll be required to compute depreciation tax sheet. So what is our tax? Tax rate, we are given 30%. Right? Tax rate, we are given 30%. Look at that case. We're told that uh, the cooperation rate of tax is 30%. So what should we be having here? I should be talking of 1760 by 30 percent which should give us 528 1360 by 0.3 which should give us 408 i'm having 1050 here by 0.3 which should give us how much 315 we're having 900 here by 0.3 which should give us 270 I'm having 840 here by 0.3, which should give us 252. And I'm having, lastly, 750 here by 0.3, which should give us 225. So these are tax, right? So these are our taxes. So I'm having cash flow before tax, cash flow after tax, cash flow after tax, cut, cash flow after tax. I should be having 1760 minus 528 which will give us 1232 i should be talking of 1360 minus 408 which should give us 952 i should be talking of 1050 here minus 315 which should give us 735 i'm having 900 here minus 270 which should give us 630 I'm having 840 here, minus 252, which should give us 588. And I'm having 750 here, minus 225, which should give us 525. So that is our cash after, cash flow after tax. And remember, in this case, you had depreciation. So what are we going to do with depreciation? We are going to compute the aspect of depreciation tax shield. So I'm having depreciation tax shield. DTS. I'm going to compute our DTS, depreciation tax shield. My good students, do you recall how to compute depreciation tax shield? I know you guys, you are a master to that depreciation tax shield. Depreciation tax shield, literally, what you are expected to do here is to compute our depreciation. After we have computed our depreciation, the next thing that uh, we will be required to do is to basically come up with what? The tax on that depreciation. These are what you are referring to it as depreciation tax shield. So how will we achieve our depreciation based on our question here? Let us see that question of ours, which is there. So depreciation, I know very well. For me to compute my depreciation, I should always be talking of our cost minus the residual value if i'm having any we divide by the estimated useful life of this project of ours or rather the machine so the cost of the machine 
how much was the cost of the machine? The cost of the machine here, we are given aspect to do with 3.7, right? That is the cost of the machine, 3.7. Mm -hmm. In that case, I'm having aspect to do with, uh, we're having, of course, that uh, the machine is to be fully depreciated over its useful life. Remember, that is the cost that we had, but we need to consider what our initial investment our initial cost which had already competed which was 6.2 remember after we added all those elements of ours right so i'll be having the ideally the total cost of this machine literally is 6.2 what is our residual value because remember we had computed that 6.2 residual value we are told that this machine basically has a residual value of 1 million so i'm having 1 million Estimated useful life. What was our estimated useful life in this case? The estimated useful life of this machine, we are told it was estimated to last for how many years? Six years. Six years. Six years. So I'll be having six here. So therefore, I'm going to have my 6.2 minus 1,000 here, divide by six. So literally, that should give us roughly like 867, right? This should give us basically like uh, 867,000. Because ideally, I know one will argue, Malimu, I'll just take the cost of the, this new machine. But remember, we had the incidental cost. So for us to determine the whole cost of this machine, of course, allow to factor in all the incidental costs that, that we incurred. So in this case, I'm having 867. I'm having 867, right? So the moment we have computed our A67, that is our depreciation. So my depreciation is 867. I need the tax shield times 0 0.3. So times the tax shield 0 0.3, which will literally give us what? 260. 260. So I'm having our depreciation tax shield here to be 260, 260, 260, 260, 260, 260. 260. Literally, I am adding this depreciation tax shield. 260, 260. So once we have determined that, actually, you can remove this. Remember what I've done? You just take, uh, I've just taken it uh, directly. Where I'm having 6.2 minus 1,000, which was our residual value, right? Divide by 6 to get that value, which is uh, 8666. Uh, with that, that value, I just multiply by 0 0.3 to get 260. So this depreciation tax shield, we need to add it. We need to add that depreciation tax shield. So that as at the end of the day, my good students here, I can have what you are going to refer to as what? As annual net after tax cash flows. Annual net after tax cash flows. So this is a what you are going also to use when we'll be computing our NPV, right? Which, in this case, we should be talking of how much. First year, 1232 plus 260. So, I'm having 1492. Uh-huh. 952 plus 260. I'm having 1212. Uh-huh. Then, in that case, I'm having 735 here. 735. Uh, 735 plus 260. I'm getting a figure of 995, 995. I'm having 630 plus 260. I'm having 890 here. We're having 588 plus 260. I'm having a figure of 848. Then I'm having 525 plus 260. I'm having a figure of 785. So this is a what I should be having as our annual net after tax cash flows which will literally assist us directly when i will be computing our npv when we'll be computing our npv so we are done with that part my good students uh-huh proceed to the next question what will we ask in the next question the next question here these are what we are told that uh uh, payback period, right? We need to compute our payback period of the machine. 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 
That is what the examiner wants us to basically compute. So, for payback period, recall, uh, when you are talking about uh, the payback period, these are what you must always have at the back of your mind. Right? Our payback period. At this point, payback period, literally, we are looking at uh, the duration when I'm going to recoup all of my investments right is like the break even so this is a point uh the duration where break even time the duration where i'm going to recoup all my investment and in this case we normally tend to talk of it in two perspectives we normally tend to look at regular cash flows in the event that you're having regular cash flows determining our payback period it will always be very simple because we we'll just be looking at our aspect to do with our cost that is of course the initial cost we divide by our annual cash flows we divide by our annual cash flows this will literally give us our payback period when i am talking of regular regular cash flows literally here we are looking at we are earning basically these are the amount that you are earning equal amount all through the years but remember, at times, we normally have irregular cash flows. Irregular cash flows. Irregular cash flows. Irregular cash flows is like this case of ours. You can see that our cash flows, basically in this case, it was a purely irregular, right? We had irregular cash flows in this case of ours. We had irregular cash flows in this case of ours. Our cash flows were not ideal, or rather they were not constant. They were, they were varying, right? So... How will you compute our payback period in this case? This will be very simple. We know very well that our initial cost is how much? Our initial cost, my good students, is 6.2. That is what we've established to be our initial cost. Uh -huh. So how long will it take us to recoup this investment? After considering, of course, all these, all these items like uh, tax and the rest, how long will it take us to recoup to recoup this cost so these are what you are going to do i'm going to have year one year two year three year four right year five and basically year six i want us to look at our cash flows so cash flows year one 1492 year two 1212 12. year three 995 year 4 890 year 5 848 and year 6 785 785 right 785 so literally this is what you are looking at right these are these are what 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 what, what you are seeing so now having that case i need us to determine these are annual cash flows right annual cash flows talk about cumulative Talk about cumulative. Talk about cumulative. How long will it take us to recoup the whole sum of 6.2? So year 1 is 14.92. Year 2, 14.92 plus 12.12. 12. Are we recouped? We've not yet recouped because this one is giving us 27.04. Year 3, I'm having, uh, basically year 3, we're having 9.95, right? That is what you're having, 9.95. Have we recouped? No. 36. 99. Mm -hmm. uh, year 4. 890. Have we recouped? No. Because this one is giving us basically uh, 45. This one is giving us 45. 89. We've not yet recouped. Year 5. Plus 848. So this one is giving us basically uh, 54. This one is giving us 54, 37. Have we recouped? We've not yet recouped. So what about year 6? Year 6 here, I'm having how much? Year 6 here, I'm having 785. And if we add it, I'm getting a figure of uh, 6. So I'm getting a figure cumulative here. I'm getting a figure of 6. Two, two, two. So, and our initial investment was 6.2. So that is to say, I am recouping this investment in between 
year five, in the period of year six, is when you are recouping our investment. So what are we going to do? First of all, you're having five years. So I'm having five years. And it is always under payback period assumption that we assume that our cash flows accrue evenly. That is always the assumption that we normally tend to use, that our cash flows accrues evenly, right? So in our case here, I'm going to ask myself this question. If, how much have we remained with to basically uh, achieve our target? In this case, so you know very well that I'm having 6.2 hour initial investment. By the time you are done with year five, at the end of year five, at the end of year five, our cumulative value was 54.37 minus 54.37. That was our cumulative value. That is our cumulative value, 5437. So for me to recoup my investment, I have remained with 763. I've remained with 763. So these are what you're going to do. This is for the whole year. 785 is for the whole year, which is 12 months. What about the balance of 763? 763 is for how many months, my good students? That is what you need to determine. So 763, I'll be having 763 times 12. In this case, we divide by 785, which will literally give us what? 11 months, right? Which will give us uh, actually, uh, say, uh, that is uh, 11.6 months or basically 11 months, right? So that is to say, in this case, we are going to take five years 11 months, five years, 11 months to basically come up with what? Five years, 11 months for us to recoup, for us to recoup our, for us to recoup our initial investment or literally in this case, uh, we're having five years, 11 months for us to basically, for us to basically recoup all our investment. We are talking of five years, 11 five years 11 months five years 11 months five years 11 months so this will be our payback period five years 11 months will be our payback period five years 11 months will be our payback period in this question of ours so basically that is what we need to have and that is what you are required to do five years 11 months okay let us proceed to the other question let's see what you have uh, the other question here we are told uh, what uh, these are what uh, we are told in this question of ours. Uh -huh. Net present value of the machine. Net present value of the machine. Net present value of the machine. So that should be very easy. That should be very easy, my good students. So first of all, we have our payback period, which is uh, basically five years, 11 months. Five years. 11 months right so we need to determine our net present value and already we had computed our cash flows right so having computed our cash flows you'll allow malimu to erase here you'll allow malimu to erase here so allow malimu to erase at this point allow malimu to erase here to compute our npv this will be very easy and why is malimu saying that this is very easy because all I need to do is now to incorporate our present value. Basically, I need to recall like a NPV. If I was to remind you, my good students, uh, our NPV, I need to write it somewhere. Will this space be enough? Mm -hmm. Let me just squeeze it somewhere here. Just a form of reminder that NPV will always be the present value of cash flows and these cash flows ideally we are talking of what net after tax cash flows minus our initial investment minus our initial costs minus our initial cost or rather the present value of the initial investment which ideally it will always be equal to one as in terms of uh, aspect of uh, this uh, pv right so i'm looking at uh our present net present value as the present value for cash flows minus our initial cost 
And in this case, my good students, recall, these are what we said. We said that any time you're talking of our present value, we need to consider these two items. We need to consider if our cash flows basically are uh, received at once. Talk about lump sum. That is a lump sum, or in this case, you are looking at what? Irregular cash flows. And talk about what aspect to do with annuity. Annuity is uh, where we are talking about what? Regular cash flows. This will literally guide you to know which factor are you going to use. Irregular cash flows is where I'm receiving different amount of cash flows all through the years. Regular is where I'm receiving it at once, or rather not at once, but uh, equal amount all through the year. And that is where we're having the concept of present value, annuity. These are present value, lump sum. In our case, you can see that uh, we had what? We had lump sum. So therefore, my present value in this case, I should recall of the concept to do with the cash flows that I'm having, of course, you multiply by, of course, one uh, plus R raised to power negative N. Mm -hmm. One plus R raised to power negative, raised to power negative N. This will literally give us, of course, our present value. And this is what we are referring to as present value uh, of course, uh, that is, of course, a uh, present value uh, interest factor, right? Present value interest factor, present value interest factor, present value interest factor, which is 1 plus R raised to our negative N. And that is what we are going to use here. So I'm going to have my present value, my present value interest, present value interest factor, present value interest factor. We are given what rate? What was our discounting rate that you are given in this question of ours? Uh, in this case, you are given a discount factor of uh, what rate? Uh -huh. Look at note number four. Note four, we are told that the corporate tax rate of uh, the, not note four, but uh, note, uh, yeah, note four, the corporate rate of tax is 30% or the cost of capital is 10%, right? So I'm having 10%. So basically, I'd be having 10% here. Mm -hmm. In this case, Monimo is going to use our shortcut. And this is the point whereby you should recall the shortcut that Molimu did. Right? So I know very well that I'll be required to have my 1 plus R, which is 10%, so 0 0.1. Uh -huh. I raise this to power negative one year that should give me zero to zero point nine zero nine one into four decimal places right the next thing that i know i should not repeat the same same formula but i should incorporate the shortcut that molimu taught us in class right how old was this shortcut was the answer that i'm having i'm going to divide by one plus r which in this case is one point one so that should give us zero point that should give us 0 0.8264. Uh, Again, what I'm going to do is just clicking equal sign. Equal sign, 0 0.7513. I believe you recall this shortcut. Equal sign, 0 0.6830. Equal sign, 0 0.6209. I know you're wondering what more what are you doing? Zero point. If you attended our classes, I know this case is very familiar to us. This shortcut is very familiar to us. This shortcut is very familiar to us. So that is what we should be having. That is what we should be having there, right? So once we have that case, my good students, what will be our present value? What will be our present value? Our present value, therefore, will be simple. I'll be having 14.92 times 0 0.9091, which in this case I'm going to have 1356, 1356.38, uh-huh, 1212 times 0 
in this case I'm going to have uh, 1001 point uh, six zero uh -huh. I'm going to have 995 by 0 0.7513 in this case I should be having 747 747.54 uh-huh I should be having 890 here by 0 0.6830 so therefore I should be talking of 6 or 7 here 6 or 7.87 then talk about the other one that should be 848 by 0 0.6209 this case should give us uh, 526.52 then lastly talk about 785 times 0. Point uh, 5645 five. this should give us a figure of 443.13 so what is the total before we deduct our initial cost the total therefore I'm having 1356.38 we're going to take 1001.60 we're going to take 7 47.54 we're going to take 6 or 7.87 we're going to take 5 to 6.52 plus 4 for 3.13 so therefore i can see that my uh, present value is 46 83.04 what about our initial cost initial cost my good students recall it was 6.2 so therefore, what will we be having? In this case, this is 46.83. These are 46.83.04. Our initial cost is 6.2. So therefore, minus uh, 6.2, I can see I'm having a negative 1516.96 to be our NPV. So my NPV here is negative. Our payback period was five years. So, the moment I've seen an NPV to be negative, that project is not desirable. We should not go with that project. We should not invest in that project completely. We should not invest in that project. We should not invest in that, in that project. So, therefore, in this case, my good students, look at it in this case. Here is what you are asked to advise now. Uh, we are asked here to basically... We are asked advise the company's management on whether to import the machine based on your results in B1, uh -huh, in B3, and B4 above. So, based on our payback period, should we invest given the fact that Note 5, you are told, the maximum acceptable payback period for the company for all capital projects is four years. We can see that this project of ours, the payback period for this project, the payback period for this project is five years and 11 months. So therefore, this is a no. For payback period is no. They should not invest in that project. They should not import that machine. What about for NPV? NPV, I'm achieving a negative net present value. And therefore, if you are achieving a negative net present value, therefore, this project will not yield returns in future. It is a project with a loss. And therefore, also using NPV, the company should not import this machine. The company should not import this machine. Because looking at the component of payback period and looking at NPV, mm -mm. They are not adding up, or rather in this case, they are not favorable. So therefore, they should not invest in this machine. So my good students, this is what you are expected to do. I know majority of you are marking for yourself now. Worry not. Worry not. I remember my good lecturer normally tend to say, we shall overcome. Right? So basically, I also know very well that if, you not, uh, if, you not, if I didn't do it uh, this way, of course, there's some marks that you can earn here and there. Right? So, but basically, that is what you're expected to do. As Again, I'm going to invite you to our financial management classes, which are ongoing. We have a pre-recorded version of the classes, and we have the live virtual classes, which you can join anytime.
our classes have commenced. For those students who are preparing for August exams, our classes are on. You can join us at any given point in time when you are ready by contacting the number below this screen. By contacting the number below this screen. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to attach a link of this uh, paper, last sitting paper. I'm also going to attach a link of topic number one, financial management, which is purely theory. So that you guys should always gauge yourself, right? And uh, don't wait for the results. More so for those who are uh, on the same level, like intermediate level. If you're done with the three papers, you can proceed with the other three papers. For those who are uh, in advanced level, and maybe you're taking like uh, compulsory papers, you can proceed and select the specialization paper, right? So that you should not waste a lot of time. I know your results will be out probably at the, by the end of the month, which uh, you'll find one month will already have elapsed. So start preparing early. Start preparing early. Yeah, that was it for this session of ours. Thank you so much for attending and listening to Molimu. We can meet in our next session. Thank you, guys.